Welcome to our first edition of Running Rampant. I'm your host, Emmanuel Burbari. It's a brand new Fordham Athletic Special in conjunction with BronxNet TV. We have a jam-packed lineup for you today. We're diving deep into the Fordham Rams community, getting to know some of the stars in the Bronx. First, we have an update with Interim Athletic Director Ed Cole, followed by WFUV's Jimmy Sullivan, and Jackson Heil catching up with women's soccer midfielder Milan Bornstein and Fordham football's Paul Rice. Then we'll get your heart rates pumping with Joe Gilfeder in our Working Out with the Rams segment. It's a new chapter in the continuing partnership with BronxNet, and we're happy to have you along for the ride. We hope you enjoy the show. In our first segment, Ed Cole highlights students returning to campus in the wake of COVID-19, ramping up practices, and looking forward to potential winter and spring seasons. Welcome back. This is our AD update. Emmanuel Barbari joined by Fordham Interim Director of Athletics, Ed Cole. Ed, thanks for being with us. Great to be with you, Manny. It's always fun to catch up. Good to see you. I hope you and your family are safe and healthy. Same to you, Ed. What's the environment been like on campus the first couple of weeks? Yeah, it, it's, been, uh, it's been great and energetic to be back on campus. Of course, unique and different in terms of our safety protocols and our health measures and obviously seeing our students throughout campus taking proper measures with social distancing and wearing their mask. And, and, but it's, uh, it's been energetic to see our, our students back, at, back in school, back in classes as of August 26th. And it's uh, exciting to talk about the opportunity to get them back into workouts and training, which is what we're excited about here from an athletic standpoint. But so far, I think the university's done an incredible job of, of their safety measures and protocols and obviously been aggressively test, testing with three mandatory tests. Um, and it's going well, and I think our students and student athletes are honoring their pledges and making sure they're, they're taking their, their responsibilities and their due diligence very seriously and uh, protecting each other and protecting their families and individuals. So, so far, so good. I, I'm happy to report. You have practices right around the corner, Ed. Any challenges or obstacles that come with getting everything in place to get the teams in the best position to practice? You, you know, it, it, it's something as you know we've planned. We've planned around for the last five months, pretty due diligently, utilizing our university task force and the thirteen working groups that put together the entire university opening document and plan, including the athletics portion of that. So uh, our our testing protocols, I think, are as good as anybody I've seen throughout the country. So very very proud about that. Uh, we've implemented, of course, that mandatory testing with our student athletes as part of the overall student body and our, fa and our administration, our staff and our department is following that as well. Uh, we're looking at surveillance testing starting on the 21st, which is extremely aggressive and, and, and obviously I'm very happy with our athletics portion of the university surveillance. They've been extremely supportive. The University Health and Wellness Group led, led by Maureen Kiwon and Greg Pappas have been uh, very, very supportive of athletics. Uh, with Aaron Cameron and Tom O'Brien and our training staff, we've established a very thorough, and Janan Paul, a very thorough surveillance testing protocol that will have daily 40 to 50 student athletes being tested. That will basically allow us within another seven or eight day period to have our entire student athletes and our coaches and our staff tested again. Uh, on a daily basis, we're doing temperature checks. We're providing daily clearance to all of our student athletes from our training room. And then even part of our university physicals, Manny, we're including the antibodies test, which is covering the cardiovascular concerns of student athletes uh, due to COVID that you're hearing about throughout the country. So we're taking every proper measure. I'm, I'm extremely confident and pleased with our team's efforts and our university support uh, of, of, of the safety and healthy protocols of our student athletes. And of course, as we look to get practices up and running and started for all of our teams, and all of our individuals for workouts and training, mask, doing proper uh, socialization, distancing, proper phases to ensure no contact and pods of, of separation and distance from all of our student athletes. So I think we've done an incredible job and followed the best in class as well as NCAA recommendations and New York State and New York City guidelines on how to uh, get up and running. Add one more for you with practices around the corner and you have the football season suspended. You're looking forward to a winter season and potentially a spring season. What does that outlook look like at the current moment? Yeah, you know, I, I think in terms of our, our training and workouts scheduling, our practice scheduling, we've been very due diligent, but very, very slow in ensuring that we do our best 
to make sure uh, that we didn't rush into anything and all the proper channels that we talked about in terms of planning were in place. Our efforts from a football standpoint and our fall sports, uh, both the Patriot League and the Atlantic 10 still have full means of looking at the spring season as a potential move. So that's our, that's our efforts, that's our planning mechanisms, and that's our strategy towards practice and workouts is for them to prepare for a spring season. And then, of course, for our winter sports, as of right now, they're continuing with the winter seasons as scheduled and as planned. I know there's some discussion of the NCAA potentially moving back the start of basketball season. We'll hopefully know a little bit more about that next week. Ed, appreciate a few minutes. Enjoy the rest of the semester. I appreciate it, Manny. Look forward to catching up with you. And thanks again for all your support. A big thanks to Ed for taking time out of his busy schedule to join us. We'll have updates every other week in Ed's first year at the helm. Coming up, WFUV's Jimmy Sullivan sits down with women's soccer midfielder Milan Bornstein. A big adjustment for athletes returning amid COVID-19. Let's get to know a ramp. I'm Jimmy Sullivan, pleased to be joined by Fordham women's soccer player, midfielder Milan Bornstein. Milan, thanks for being here. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for being here and taking some time. How have you been uh, faring with everything and doing over the past six months or so? You know, I'm good. Uh, it's definitely nice to be back, but it's not the same as it was before, obviously. So it's just been kind of like a learning curve, A, trying to follow rules because there's so many new rules, so it's tough to follow them. Um, and B, just like trying to get get back to normal, get back to a schedule. So, but it's good. It's good to be back for sure. Yeah, I, I could certainly uh, concur with that. Let me ask you, because you're going into your fourth year at Fordham. You're a senior now. How did you first, one, hear about Fordham and two, uh, decide to come to the Bronx? So Fordham was actually one of the first schools that I visited. And funny enough, I was so young. So my mom was kind of like, Milan, like, I know you love the city. Like, I just think Arthur Ave would be such a cool place for you. So I kind of just came on a whim to a uh, soccer camp here. And I forgot my ball. <laughs> and so I was driving up East Fordham Road with my mom looking for a ball. Because I didn't know that in college, you don't even need to bring your own ball. Like, it's not even that big of a deal. <laughs> Uh, but once I left, I like told my mom, mom, I, I, I loved it. Like, I really, really loved it. And she just kept saying like, I, I believe you, but this is the first school you've gone to. Like, why don't we just like wait? And every other school I visited, I was like, nope, still Fordham. Like, I would just keep visiting. And it was like, Fordham just kept on being my number one. So then from there, I just like, I, I knew I loved it when I came on campus. So in your experience now that you've been on the team for a couple of years, what are your favorite things about being a part of the Fordham women's soccer program? I would definitely say this may sound cliche, but seriously, like every year, every single team is like so good together. Like I've never like been around like a group of 20 every single year where everyone is just so close as friends and everyone just looks out for each other on so many different levels. Like even though we play like such a highly competitive environment, everyone's always rooting for everyone. Like it doesn't matter who's on the field, who's off the field, who's playing your position, who's not playing your position. Like everyone is seriously so supportive of you as a soccer player, you as a student and who you are as a person. Um, and it's so great to have people from all different like parts of the country, parts of the world, you know, we have, Emma and Claudia and Maria coming in. So I definitely have to say it's, it's just been like getting to know probably about like 40 different girls at this point. So it's been amazing. Just knowing people at such a personal level and loving everyone. So. Yeah. And you could see that culture definitely over the years, people leave, people come back in. L let me ask you, because this has been kind of a, you know, a tough time with college sports and you guys would have been playing by now, but you guys have your season postponed for now. What are some things that either you had been doing before or that you've picked up since that you've been doing outside of soccer, hobbies, anything like that? What, what would that be? Um, well, funny enough, over quarantine, I was trying to teach myself how to do some video editing, just try to get that under my belt. So actually, if you guys check out the Fordham Wosock Instagram, I actually edited a couple of those vlogs 
Um, so I learned how to do that. And other than that, I've just been trying to keep busy, like trying to get internships, trying to get stuff with jobs for post-college life. But the I'm movie stuff you should you should check that out because you know you're probably good at that, so you can give me some critiques <laughs> well i have to admit no i'm not good at it how long did it take you to like pick that up that would be my final question was it how, how difficult of a process was it um well i had like a bunch of different girls on the team send me like different types of videos so once i got them i would say it took me like two videos that took me all day and then once i kind of got the hang of it it was an easier process, but I also only use iMovie, so it's kind of like made for for dummies to sound that complicated. <laughs> so I just everyone kind of just sent me clips, and I just put it together with some music. So, but you best believe, proficient iMovie is going on my resume. So <laughs> don't tell yourself short. I'm sure it's more difficult than that. She's <laughs> Milan Bornstein, senior midfielder on the Florida women's soccer team. Milan, thanks for taking some time with us. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, my name is Coach Gately and I'm the head women's basketball coach at Fordham University. I know this has not been the spring or the summer many of us have planned on. And I know this fall and the school year will look a lot different than anything we probably experienced before. We thought a fun way to learn about converting fractions into percentages would be to use our free throw percentage as an example. A player takes a free throw if they are fouled while taking a shot or if the defense has more than five team fouls in a quarter. During the 2019-2020 season, the Fordham Rams shot 335 free throws and we made 267 of them. To calculate free throw percentage, we divide the number of shots made with the number of shots taken. If you convert that into a decimal, it would be 0.797. If we wanted to convert that decimal into a percentage, we would multiply that by 100 and then you would end up with 79.7%. Shooting 79.7% from the free throw line made us the second best free throw shooting team in the country. Thanks for tuning in to Ramstat. We hope that you are staying healthy and safe. Please wear a mask to protect others and hopefully we'll see you at Rose Hill very soon. Go Rams. All right, time for a coach's profile segment. Jackson Heil joined by Fordham defensive coordinator, Paul Rice. Paul, thanks for taking the time. How's it going? It's going great. Happy to be here. Well, Paul, obviously a crazy few months it's been for everyone during a global pandemic. Uh, what's been keeping you busy during these crazy times? Well, I think, you know, initially when um, we were all let go and, and people were kind of kicked off campus in March, it was, you know, we were in the middle of spring ball. So it was trying to figure out how we were going to keep up with the installs and, and keep our players engaged um, through kind of an indefinite period, which ended up obviously getting us to right around now. And once the school year ended, um, the focus was getting, hopefully getting to, to play a season, which obviously didn't play out. Um, so there was kind of some ebbs and flows of preparation there for the season, um, all mixed with just a lot of recruiting. And we've had to get pretty creative with, uh, and I think we've done a good job of getting creative with how we're going to, uh, to sell Fordham football and Fordham University. Played four years at Yale. You were a captain there, all Ivy League linebacker. And then a lot of your time since then has been spent coaching. Is coaching something you've always wanted to get into? And was that something you were looking to pursue right away when things were done? Um, it wasn't something that, you know, as soon as I you know left high school and went to college, I was really thinking about doing. But I think over the course of college, um, I was fortunate to be around some really good coaches uh, and actually eventually end up you know, starting my career working for some of those coaches. Uh, and, you know, being around that and that environment um, just made me want to pay it forward. And for those who have been invested in sports, sports just means so much to them, particularly all of us as well. What does the game of football mean to you? It's a, oh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, football is, uh, it's so many things for so many people. Uh, it is, you know, for, uh, for myself and I know for all of our players in some way, shape or form, I think the word passion will be put in there um, and used uh, in some way, shape or form. Um, but, you know, really, I think it is, it's a, it, it is an opportunity for kids um, to, uh, to develop, you know, outside of the classroom, outside of their families, um, to grow and learn through, uh, you know, through adversity, through challenges, through successes and failures. Um, I think it is, you know, it inherently teaches you teamwork, which is probably its most important and, and valuable asset 
uh, is that it teaches you how to, to work with other people and, and strive for a goal that's bigger than yourself. So it's certainly, I believe, the greatest game on earth. You were a linebacker back in your day at Yale, and Fordham has two of the best in the Patriot League in Ryan Greenhagen and Glenn Cunningham. What's it been like to watch those two specifically grow in your two-plus years now at Fordham? I mean, you, those two individuals, um, just the way they attack every day. You know, they, they come in with a purpose, um, whether, it's, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's on the field, whether it's in the film room. Um, they really attack each day. Um, kind of in their own unique ways, but with the same mindset of, hey, we're just going to get better today, and I'm going to bring along my teammates as well as best I can. So being around those two guys, uh, it, it's, it's certainly um, a pleasure and an honor to coach those guys, and I just try and tell them, to, tell them where to go and then let them go play because they're, they're, they're really, really good football players. Obviously, with the Patriot League announcing there will be no football in the fall, kind of things go back to square one for you guys as you try to prepare for hopefully what will be a season in the spring. What's these next few months going to look like for you guys to try to keep everyone busy and try to keep everyone in football shape, knowing that there may or may not be a season in the spring? You know, it's obviously going to be about you know, getting guys back on campus safely, keeping them safe, keeping our community safe as best we can. Um, and I think that's issue A, number one. Um, everything after that, and in our opinion, is kind of gravy. So if we can stay on campus and we can, um, you know, get our guys back in, in the weight room and on the field practicing in some way, shape, or form, then I think we're, you know, we'll call that a, a victory. What would be your advice to someone who is trying to pursue a career in coaching and the things that you've learned along the way? Get in wherever you can and, and do the smallest job possible. I, when I, so my senior spring um, uh, in college, I ended up, you know, a team that I was just the captain of the year before, I went out in the spring and I was setting up the field for spring ball. Practice started at 6 a.m. So I'm setting oh, up the linebacker drills that I did, you know, four months ago. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it was, it's a, you need to learn the game from the ground up. And I'm still learning the game from the ground up. But, um, you know, the, the, however you can get in, try, you know, do whatever job you possibly can, whether it's in high school, college, if you're lucky enough to get in at the NFL level. Um, but just – be a sponge. Be a sponge wherever you are, and um, there's no job too small. Ford defensive coordinator Paul Rice taking some time with us right now. Paul, thank you so much for joining us, and best of luck in keeping everyone ready and safe during this fall semester. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks to Jackson and Paul. Some perspective as Fordham football stays ready this fall. Speaking of workouts, get up out of your seats. It's time for our seventh inning stretch. Assistant Athletic Director for Athletic Performance Joe Gilfeder brings us through a workout with the Rams. Welcome to Walsh Varsity Training Center, guys. I'm Joe Gilfeder, Associate Athletic Director of Athletic Performance, and today we're gonna to be working out with the Ram. Now, this is a workout that can be done at any place, any time, and it requires minimal equipment. Now, we're gonna utilize a protocol called peripheral heart training. With this type of training, we're gonna alternate between upper body and lower body exercise. Now this offers a few different benefits for us. The constant blood flow from upper to lower body is going to increase caloric expenditure and we're still gonna be able to build strength and maximize our time training. For this first exercise grouping, we're going to pair push-ups with a single leg glute bridge, right? I'll demonstrate push-ups right now. Now when we're doing push-ups, we wanna make sure that we're going all the way down, all the way up. Okay, we wanna make sure that our head shoulders, hips, knees, and feet are all in alignment. Now, if we need to scale this exercise back, we can always elevate our hands on a bench or even the wall. That'll make it a little bit easier, okay? If we wanna make it a little bit harder, we can actually elevate our feet. Now, we wanna shoot for 10 to 15 repetitions. So for some people, we may actually need to add some weight in the form of a backpack on our back or a weight plate on our back. And for some of us, it might be better suited to uh, elevate our hands so that we can get that full range of motion and really work the muscles that we're trying to work. Now the exercise that we want to pair with that push-up is a single leg glute bridge. This is going to work the back half of our lower body, our glutes, our hamstrings, our lower back. Flat on the back, one knee bent, one leg is extended out. I'm going to drive through my heel and raise my hips to the sky. 
Now what's important with the single leg glute bridge is that we want to do an equal number of repetitions on our left leg as we do on our right. And very similar with the push-ups, we're going to do between 10 and 15 reps per side. Now the single leg glute bridge can be done with just body weight or you can actually add weights in the form uh, of a backpack or a weighted plate or a dumbbell on top of your hips to increase the difficulty. Now we want to go from the push-ups to the single leg glute bridge with very minimal rest time and let's shoot between three and four sets each. So the second exercise grouping that we're going to utilize is a banded or weighted row and a reverse lunge. Now to go over the banded or weighted row, this is where maybe the minimal equipment will come into play, but we'll suit it for anybody based on what you have available to you. Now, if you do have uh, a resistance band at your disposal, we can very e easily utilize that, okay, uh, in a seated row position. Again, let's shoot for 10 to 15 repetitions based on your strength level. Now, if you don't have an exercise band at your disposal, we can very easily utilize something around the house, whether that be a dumbbell, a kettlebell. Some people will have a, a backpack uh, available to them. You can fill it up with as many books as you'd like. I'll demonstrate that movement now. We may have to stagger our feet a little bit. We'll keep our core nice and tight, bent over at the waist, and pull towards our rib cage. So with our row exercise, we're gonna pair that with a reverse lunge. So in order to do a reverse lunge, we're gonna stand up tall, we're gonna take a big giant step back, lightly touch our knee to the ground, and then return. Now remember, we're gonna do that for 10 to 15 repetitions per leg. Again, let's shoot for three to five sets total between those two exercises. So our third exercise pairing is going to incorporate a little bit of dynamic movement to it. We're going to you know, make sure that we utilize that athleticism and build upon it. The two exercises that we're going to pair together are mountain climbers and squat jumps. Okay, We want to do between 10 and 15 repetitions each, again shooting for three to five rounds of each exercise. Now for our mountain climbers, we want to get into a push-up position, keeping our core tight okay, and butt level to the ground. I'm going to drive my knees to my chest. Now when we count mountain climbers, this is one that people always try to make a little bit easier. It's left, right, one. Left, right, two. Left, right, three. As opposed to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We've got to make sure that we're getting enough repetitions per side to really get the benefits from this exercise. Now directly after doing 10 to 15 mountain climbers per side, we're going to transition into a squat jump. Okay, so we want to have our feet about hip width apart, chest up, and we're going to squat down, squat up, squat down, squat up, down, up, again, for 10, 10 to 15 repetitions. We want to try and make sure that we're jumping as high as we possibly can. So now that we've worked our upper body, we've worked the front, the back, the lower, front, back, we want to transition to finishing with core training. Now a lot of people will do continuous amounts of sit-ups and crunches. Uh, we want to actually train our core for stabilization. That's how we work our athletes, is making sure that we have a stable, strong core to avoid lower back pain and help us do what we want to do on the field. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a three-way plank. We're going to hold for 30 seconds in a front plank, 30 seconds on one side plank, 30 seconds on the other, and that will be one set. And we'll finish with three sets of that to conclude our workout. So when we're doing a front plank, we want to make sure that our head, our hips, our knees, and our feet are all in alignment. We're not piking our butt up. We're keeping everything level, keeping everything tight. Hold for 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, we're going to transition to one of our sides uh, to do a side plank. Again, when we're doing a side plank, we want to make sure that we keep our hips level, our head back, and our chest opened up. After 30 seconds, we're going to switch to the other side. Remember to stay strong on those planks. Don't let your hips sag and keep that core tight. Remember, we're going to finish with three sets of 30 seconds on every position, front, side, and side. 
That's going to conclude our training session, working out with the Ram. Thanks to Coach Gilfeder for getting our hearts racing here on the show. Very few work as hard as this next Ram. Now a running back for the Arizona Cardinals, Chase Edmonds, who sat down with Fordham softball alum Maria Tribal Peaks to reflect on his career as one of the most dominant forces in Fordham football history. You ended up being the Patriot League and the Fordham all-time career rushing leader. What was that like? Was that Did you think that you would have that much success in your time? I, I thought so, just because after my freshman year, I got off to a really good start. And I kind of, I mean, my freshman year really opened my eyes to uh, my talents. And it was something that I just, I truly wanted to embrace. You know, uh, I always had the dream of playing on Sundays. Even though I was at Rose Hill, you know, obviously it was, it was kind of not, not unheard of, but, you know, we had scouting. But, you know, it's, it's very rare for someone to get drafted to, to, to NFL from Rose Hill. And um, after my freshman year, it kind of just opened my eyes up. So, really, I embraced that, man. I embraced that role. I embraced that position, and I really just wanted to compete for excellence at all times. And what were some of your favorite memories, not just, you know, on the field at Fordham, but off the field? I mean, you you were there for a couple of years, so. Man, I mean, countless memories. Um, I still talk to the guys that were in my class and in the class before me and the class ahead of me just about the times that we've had. You know, we're still in those funny group messages, always clowning around and everything like that. Uh, it's, it's so much countless memories, but – um. If I had to pick out one that would just would stand out, it would probably be just uh, really the, the the days counting down to my senior year when, like, you kind of when I knew I had to go. You know, I knew I was leaving after winter, uh, after fall semester. So that, like, last maybe month, month and a half, really from uh, kind of just basically the month of December, just really spending those hours with those guys and just talking about everything we had been through. A perfect way to wrap up our first edition of Running Rampant. We'll be back in two weeks. We hope you enjoyed the show and stick around. I'm your host, Emmanuel Barbari. Huge thanks to the crew who pieced this show together. We'll see you next time.